Hello, and the iconic background behind me will tell you immediately where I am today. And for those of you who are not familiar, this is Bamborough. First of all, I would like to say a huge thank you to the many thousands of you who have watched, commented and subscribed to my channel because of the trilogy of films I made in 2020. They've proved a huge success, so thank you. Many of you requested me to look at the castles of Northumberland, so that is what we're going to be looking at in this series. There are something like 70 castles and towers in all. Not all of them are accessible, as they are privately owned, and some do not allow filming. So some you might know of may be missing from this programme, but that is the reason why. You will hear the same famous family names being repeated again that were mentioned in the last series, such as Percy, Ogle, Joycey, Delaville, and others that you won't have heard of, such as Bertram, Cresswell, and many others, all woven into a rich tapestry of history that forms Northumberland's heritage. There's quite a bit more history involved with this presentation, but hopefully you'll still find it interesting and enjoyable as my last series was. Northumberland has such a rich history due to it providing the stage for over a thousand years of conflict, not only between the English and the Scots or the Plantagenets with the Tudors, but also Roman, Anglo-Saxon and Norman invasions. The play that has been acted out here was very heavily intertwined with marriages of convenience, political manoeuvring and lands and properties being traded for political favours and alliances. These lands were vast in size and often included several castles and properties. Down through the centuries, the powerful earls, lords and barons jostled with the royalty in playing out this intricate and complex web of historical drama. We begin the drama here in Berwick-upon-Tweed with this gorgeous Northumbrian weather which we have all the time up here, I kid you not. It's been the scene of many battles between the English and Scots from the end of the Roman occupation until 1482, when it became permanently part of England, changing hands more than 12 times. The name Berwick is from the Anglo-Saxon words bear, meaning barley, and wick meaning town, so Berwick is Barley Town. After the Romans left, the land between the River Forth in the north and the Tweed here at Berwick was inhabited by the Britons of Brinock. Under Anglo-Saxon rule it became part of Bernicia and when it merged with Deira or Durham as we know it today um, it formed Northumbria under King Edred of England. After the Scots won the Battle of Carnham near Coldstream in 1018, the area around Berwick passed into Scottish rule. After King David I of Scotland succeeded the throne in 1124, he commissioned the first castle here and made Berwickshire a royal borough. After his death, the Scottish throne then passed to Malcolm IV and then to his younger brother William I in 1165. Berwick's strategic position on the border has led it to be the scene of many wars, raids and takeovers. In 1154, Henry II became the first Plantagenet King of England through his marriage to Queen Eleanor of France, 
He also governed Normandy, Anjou and Aquitaine, which basically meant Henry was the King of England and also most of France. When Henry decided to give three castles and land to his youngest son, his wife and three other sons began a revolt with William of Scotland in 1173. During the Battle of Annick in 1174, the revolt was crushed and William was captured and imprisoned in Falaise in France. There he was forced to sign a treaty which signed over the castles and all lands of Berwick, Roxburgh, Jedburgh, Edinburgh and Stirling to the English. When Henry died, his third son Richard took the throne and Berwick was sold back to the Scots to fund the Crusades in 1190. During the next 100 years, Berwick became very prosperous and important. So was the place where the arbitration over the Scottish crown was contested between John Balliol and Robert the Bruce, presided over by Edward I in 1291. In 1296, England was at war with France and with which Scotland was in alliance. So when Balliol invaded Northern England, Edward attacked Berwick, capturing the town and massacred 20,000 inhabitants. <laughs> Edward rebuilt the earlier castle and strengthened the walls. In 1318, the arm of William Wallace was hung from the walls after his execution at the Tower of London. After the English were defeated at Bannockburn, the Scots along with the French and some Germans blockaded Berwick and then finally recaptured it in 1318. Following the Battle of Halidon Hill in 1333, Berwick was back in English hands. By 1461, Berwick was given back to Scotland by Margaret of Anjou, who was married to Henry VI, in return for his support against the House of York in the War of the Roses. In 1482, Richard III recaptured Berwick and it's remained English ever since. This is what's left of the original castle today. Berwick Railway Station is built on the site of the original castle and this corner tower is all that remains in the grounds of the Castle Vale Bed and Breakfast Hotel. In 1551, Queen Elizabeth I had the walls rebuilt in Trace Italien style, um, which was the most expensive project during the Elizabethan reign. What you see today is what's left of that Elizabethan renovation. In the 1500s, gunpowder cannons came to dominate warfare and the existing castles often presented blind spots where the enemy could uh, attack. So the Italian style was adopted from an Italian design whereby the fortifications were designed in such a way that there were no blind spots and uh, the cannon um, armoury were able to defend adequately.
Norham Castle was commissioned in 1121 by Ranulf Flambard, Bishop of Durham. In medieval England, the bishops of Durham enjoyed king-like status in return for keeping order along the border with Scotland. Norham Castle, along with the castle in Berwick, Andwark, protected the river crossings over the River Tweed into England. The castle would have originally been built as a Mott and Bailey, and you will hear this term frequently. Mott is a French word meaning mound, and Bailey is an Anglo-Norman word meaning clearing. So a Mott and Bailey castle would be a wooden tower built on a rise or high ground, and these towers were often later replaced with stone towers. Norham was besieged by the Scots 13 times in its history. The first to do so was David I of Scotland in 1136. It was soon returned to the bishops only to be recaptured again in 1138 and this time was damaged significantly and lay derelict. In 1153 Henry II ordered it to be rebuilt and the great tower you see today was erected. Between 1208 and 1212, King John spent large sums on strengthening the castle. Alexander II besieged Norham in 1215 for 40 days, but failed to take it. And in 1219, a peace treaty was signed, which lasted most of the 13th century. 1296 saw Edward I at war with Scotland for a prolonged period along the border. The Scots tried unsuccessfully to take Norham Castle in 1318, again in 1319 and again in 1322. They eventually took it in 1327 but then handed it back to the bishops the following year. Norham Castle then enjoyed peace until 1513, when James IV invaded England. James was defeated and killed three weeks later at the Battle of Flodden, and Norham was handed back again to the bishops. The castle was rebuilt and strengthened again, and maintained for the rest of that century, but Elizabeth I refused to spend any money on it, having spent so much at Berwick. In 1603, the English and Scottish crowns became one, and Norham was no longer important. It fell into decline, as you see it today, until 1923 when it was given to English heritage, who are the custodians of the castle today.
Norham that we just visited uh, is about four or five miles west of Berwick and here we are at the third castle Twizel which is about another four or five miles west of that. So all of these three castles Berwick, Norham, Twizel and Wark that we're going to next were all strategically placed along the River Tweed to defend it from the Scots. Twizel Castle began as a tower house around 1415. However, this was destroyed by James IV of Scotland in 1496. In 1520, the land was sold to the Selby family, a wealthy member of the English gentry who owned several estates in Northumberland and Durham. They repaired the buildings and it remained with the family until 1685 when it was sold to Sir Francis Blake. In 1770 Blake began a Gothic recreation of the castle but this was never completed. In 1882 the castle was demolished by the Blake family and the stone used for a new mansion at Tilmouth Park. Today it's the Tilmouth Park Hotel. Today Twizel Castle remains a folly and then in the at-risk category listed by English Heritage. Wark Castle was built in 1136 as a timber mott and bailey on a glacial ridge. As we know a mott is a mound or raised area of ground with a wooden or stone keep built on it and a bailey is an adjacent walled courtyard surrounded by a protective ditch and palisade or fence. In 1138 Wark was captured when King David I invaded England. His aim was to reclaim the former kingdom of Northumbria. After Henry II succeeded the throne, he took Wark back in 1157 and built a stone octagonal keep with surrounding stone walls. The castle withstood the attack by William I during the revolt against Henry in 1174. In 1200, the castle was given to Robert de Ross one of the barons of King John's court. The barons fell into dispute and forced the king to sign the Magna Carta in 1215, which basically gave the barons more power and less liability for paying taxes to the crown. Neither side honored the document, and in 1216, King John sent his army and attacked York, Durham, Berwick, and Edinburgh. On his march north, Wark was destroyed. When Henry III succeeded the throne, Wark was given back to Robert de Ross and it was rebuilt. During the Wars of Scottish Independence, Edward I launched his successful attack at Dunbar in 1296 from Wark, and his son Edward II used the castle in the same way, though his attack ended in defeat at Bannockburn in 1314. In the following years, Wark was destroyed and rebuilt several times as Scottish armies repeatedly attacked Northern England. Not until 1603, when the English and Scottish crowns were united, did Wark fall into peaceful times. By 1645, the castle was abandoned and fell into ruin, 
and the stone used to build surrounding settlements which is why today as you can see there's very little of it left and what is left is vastly overgrown. The original manor house that occupied this site was owned by the Manners family from 1232. Robert Manners replaced the original manor house with a residential tower which you can see behind me there. These would have had livestock living on the ground floor and the family rooms above on the second and third floors. This made them relatively safe from attack. However, because Ethel is so close to the border, um, it was constantly attacked during the border wars and local feuds with the Heron family who owned the neighbouring Ford Castle, which is where we're going next. Manners was given permission by King Edward III to crenellate the tower and by 1350 the gatehouse and surrounding walls were added. Robert Manners died in 1354 and the estate passed down through a succession of sons in the Manners family. In 1495, the castle passed to George Manners, who inherited the title of Baron de Ross from his mother and left Ethel in the care of the Collingwood family to be closer to court life. It was briefly captured by James IV in 1513 when he invaded England. However, when James was killed in the Battle of Flodden, which is close to here, Um, it was returned to the Manners family a month later. In 1547, the Manners family swapped Ethel for lands further south in Yorkshire, away from the Troubles, and the castle was bought by the Crown. It remained important to the border defence, but fell into poor repair. Following James VI of Scotland and I of England uniting the crowns in 1603, Ethel was no longer important, and as with most of the border castles, they were superfluous to need. Ethel lay in ruins until 1908 when Lord Joycey bought the estate. Um, it's still owned by the Joycey family today and they, in association with English Heritage, uh, run the site and manage it um, today. We're here at Ford Castle, which is two or three miles along the road from Ethel and still part of Joyce's land. The first record of a castle here at Ford is 1287, which was probably a fortified manor house and held by the Heron family. In 1335, the castle was rebuilt to form a quadrangle with towers on each corner. It was included in the border defence of Northumberland along with Berwick, Norham, Wark, Bamborough and Chillingham. The Heron family were well known for being border reavers and constantly involved in local feuds. It's worth pointing out uh, at this stage 
that the Reavers were a band of lawless men from various families, um, wealthy families as well, um, living in these castles and tower houses. Um, they didn't have any allegiance to either Scotland or England, only to each other. And they were constantly feuding over hundreds of years, not just in Northumberland, but also across the border in Scotland. In 1385, William Heron was imprisoned by Henry Percy, the Earl of Northumberland, for carrying out a reaver raid into Scotland during a period of truce. William Heron and his sons were killed in 1428 when they were feuding with the Manners family at Etel Castle, where we've just been. Both Etel and Ford Castles were captured by James IV in 1513. Um, and he, uh, James actually stayed at Ford Castle the night before the Battle of Flodden. Of course, when he was killed, afterwards this castle was returned to the Heron family. Ford then passed to the Carr family through marriage and the northern wing was built that forms the basis of the current structure. Parsons Tower was a medieval peel tower similar to those found extensively across Northumberland. You can see it behind me. Um, it was occupied by the parson at the castle and destroyed by James IV in 1513. After the union of the crowns in 1603, Ford, like most of the border castles, were no longer required. And in 1694, it was converted into a stately home and then passed to the Delaval family in 1718. The Delaval family remodelled it more than once over the decades, which is why there is a mix of architectural styles. In 1907, it was acquired by James Joycey, the Baron of Northumberland, and remains in the Joycey family today. In 1956, it was leased to Northumberland County Council as a young person's residential centre. Okay, here we are at Coupland Castle. This is the last uh, castle we're going to be visiting in this section, which I'm entitling the Border Castles, simply because they are very, very close or actually on the Scottish border. Um, and this castle, as you can probably see, is inhabited and privately owned by the Gell family. Prior to the castle being built, the land surrounding Coupland belonged to Sir John de Coupland, who captured King David II of Scotland during the Battle of Neville's Cross in Durham in 1346. Although it is known as a castle today, it was originally built as a tower house around 1584 by the Wallace family, following a recommendation that a chain of forts be built along the border with Scotland. It was in fact the last one to be built before the unification of England and Scotland in 1603. Over the years the tower was added to by various owners, the taller tower built after 1603. The date stone over the fireplace in the tower reads GW1615MW, thought to be George and Mary Wallace the then owners. In 1713, Coupland Tower was owned by Sir Challoner Ogle, Admiral of HMS Swallow and one of the descendants of the Ogle family, a recognised Northumbrian family. In 722, Ogle's ship was responsible for killing the notorious pirate Bartholomew Roberts in a battle off Cape Lopez on the west coast of Africa. Bartholomew Roberts was an infamous pirate 
and of course the character on which Jack Sparrow um, was based from the Pirates of the Caribbean played by Johnny Depp of course. Sometime towards the end of the 1700s the tower was gutted by fire and lay derelict. In 1806 Thomas Bates bought the burned out remains of the tower from Nathaniel Ogle, a relative, and by 1820 had restored the tower and added the three bay two-storey house to the side which you can see there behind me. Coopland is apparently haunted, the sound of dragging feet being heard uh, along the corridors uh, and it was reportedly exercised in 1925. As I said at the beginning, today the castle is owned by the Gell family and the Peel Tower can be hired for events and stays. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell so you will receive notifications of whenever a new episode is posted. Next, we're off to look at the coastal castles, so please join us for that.